Although Adam Smith first made reference to the church and the wealth of nations, more recently, the economic approach to the study of religion has brought four main insights. First, highlighting the value of thinking about religion in terms of club goods models, religious markets, and about differentiated products in that market. Second, religious norms might act as an informal coordinating mechanism, increasing trust, morals, informal incentives through imposing social sanctions, especially in developing societies where there is an absence of well-developed legal systems, property rights, and formal markets. And third, the recent economics research has highlighted the relationship between religion and public goods provision, something that others here have also been talking about. In economics, we know that individuals make decisions that benefit them and also society, and this in turn influences markets, hierarchies, and the allocation of resources. So if religious motives influence individuals' economic decision-making, then ultimately this might affect economic systems. For example, think of the institution of dowry as they are given in South Asian marriage markets, even though it is illegal to give or to take a dowry. The notion itself has religious origins in terms of how sons and daughters are valued in Hinduism, but today we think far less about the religious motives. Nevertheless, the economic consequences of dowry in South Asia are huge, whether for the family's <coughs> likelihood of going into debt, for women's health and autonomy, and though it has religious origins, the economic consequences of it does eventually affect resource allocation. So religious motives can influence economic decision making, and I think this matters very much for how people perceive the value of education and healthcare. For example, certain religious traditions may be opposed to certain kinds of education, partly because of a perceived epistemological conflict between science and religion. On the other hand, a couple of months ago, I was doing some fieldwork in North India, conducting workshops for madrasa teachers, trying to understand issues with respect to modernizing the curriculum in these religious schools, how to teach English, mathematics, science, and computers. And I found that the teachers there were, in fact, very open to introducing these scientific subjects into the curriculum. This is going to have an impact on education provision in South Asia more widely. So by emphasizing spiritual capital as a basis for development, this scholarship is essentially emphasizing the socioeconomic aspects of religious communities rather than purely the effect of religious faith. For example, I've been doing a project recently in India with Chanda Velu and Melvin Weeks, who are both, ba both based here in Cambridge, and our research project is asking a very simple question. How do religious organizations provide and change their religious and non-religious services in response to income inequality and the competition for adherence? And to examine this particular question, we've conducted the first large-scale economic survey of religious institutions in India between 2006 and 2008. We've collected data by fieldwork on 568 Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, Jain organizations in seven major Indian states. And we basically talked to temples, mosques, churches, gurdwaras, religion-based NGOs, religion-based family trusts, communes, religion-based charities, and welfare societies. Our data essentially covers demographics, religious service provision, innovations to religious practice, non-religious service provisions such as education and health, adherence, donations, and expenditures. Just to give you a very brief flavor of this research, what are we actually finding? We find that propagation of the faith and religious education were the two most important religious services provided by the organizations. We also found that worship at places of worship rather than at home <coughs> women going to places of worship and spirituality had greatly increased um, since 1991. I think this is one of the more interesting changes we found in India because Hinduism typically does not emphasize communal worship. Another aspect was the manner in which religious services were being communicated across religions, for example, by using technology to promote them. For example, many Hindu temples now are using the internet and video technology to screen wedding ceremonies in real time to relatives and families who live outside India. Many organizations also use mobile phone technologies to keep in touch with their congregations. So every morning when you get up, you get your thought for the day from your friendly neighborhood guru or imam. In our field work, we even found a mobile phone handset that was shaped like the head of the Hindu god Ganesh, complete with orange elephant ears and elephant trunk and a Hindu holy mark on the forehead. This then led us to investigate the non-religious services provided by organizations, the most common of which, as has already been mentioned, are education, health, employment, childcare, and other services. And here again, we find striking religious variations 
The Hindus in India are mainly providing food distribution. The Muslims and the Christians are providing more education services in our sample. The Christians are providing education, health, and childcare. And we think that these religious variations are related to a number of factors, such as overcoming the constraints with the curriculum in government schools and the role of religious schools in these communities. There were lots of other services provided as well, blood donation and other medical camps, flood relief, old age homes, group marriages for the poor, Economists among you will be interested that there were very interesting microfinance schemes. For example, just as a bank lends money to its customers, some of the temples have facilities to lend a cow to a farmer to help plow the land in order to deal with adverse income shocks. One temple in Gujarat even provided aerobics classes to keep the congregation both spiritually and physically fit. So we think that since 1991, when the Indian economy was liberalized, as the society is becoming more aspirational and wealthy, due to increases in inequality and religious competition, which has accompanied economic growth, all the religious organizations are actually providing more non-religious services, such as education and health. I'd like to stress that this is a very positive role that many of them are playing in their local communities by contributing to activities that build social capital and address economic necessity. Finally, in questioning the role of religion in development, I personally think that there are still a great deal of unanswered questions. First, what does it actually mean to be religious? Is it intrinsic or is it more socially driven? Second, uh, as economists, we've seen a great deal of economic development across a range of countries at a macro level, and yet religion seems both very pervasive and still very persistent. Why is religion still so pervasive and persistent even as countries are becoming richer? And third, especially in non-Christian and non-Western societies, what might make the nature of religion there similar or different to the UK or the US? I think we need to understand much more the economics of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and tribal religions, especially in Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. In the end, if we are interested in the links between prosperity, poverty, and piety, I think there are still a great many questions for young graduate students out there and others to be thinking about. Thank you very much. Ms.